So in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the Lansdowne High School preliminary. So. It's, it's on. It's on. So speak through here. Yeah. No, see, I I think this has to be muted. That's what I had. <laughs> Okay, I'll speak loudly. Ready? Good afternoon. I now call to order the Lansdowne High School preliminary design presentation. Mr. Dixit, please state your name for the record and please introduce your staff presenting today. So good evening, Chair, Ms. Joes, and members of the board and facilities committee. My name is Pete Dixit. I'm executive director for facilities management and strategic planning. Uh, what we have today is uh, a design preliminary design presentation for Lansdowne High School as part of the capital improvement pr program. <clears throat> Board had already approved the school. Today we are here with my team members under the leadership of Merrill Plate, Director of Construction and Improvement, joined by Mike Archbold, who's our manager of design and Kaylee Hopped. Uh, she's the project manager and GWWO representative Brian Minnick. Uh, before we give it to Brian, I just want to acknowledge my gratitude for all the people in construction in curriculum and instruction on the construction side and so many other uh, divisions that have helped us during the review of this design. Uh, we request that you save your questions till the end, and I'll ask Brian to make the presentation. All right, thank you, Pete. Uh, pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name is Brian Minnick, associate with GWWO Architects, and uh, happy here to present uh, Lansdowne High School preliminary design. Uh, quick, uh, we'll get on the agenda. We'll go over some general information, talk about our project goals, uh, go show a little bit about the location and what's unique about the site. Uh, we'll show about how the building is organized, and at the end, we'll wrap it up with some 3D animation so you can get a feel for what the project is going to look like. So the project Lansdowne High School is located on the southern uh, portion of Baltimore County. Uh, some general information. This is a new replacement school on an existing site. Our target student rated capacity for the project is 1,759 students. There are two regional programs associated with the school, a community schools initiative program, as well as a uh, special education files program. Uh, the school also currently has three magnet programs, the Academy of Arts and Communications, Academy of Health and Human Services, and the Academy of Science, Engineering, and Information Technology. Our project goals are to provide a 21st century learning experience for all of the students. Uh, we, we try to create collaborative uh, expanded learning spaces throughout the building so that all students have an opportunity to use these breakout spaces and provide a centralized multifunctional uh, learning space for all students. The CTE classrooms, the career and technology education classrooms are spread throughout the building so everyone gets an opportunity to see what opportunities they have within the school. And we utilize state-of-the-art technology throughout the project. The project will implement a sustainable design. The project will achieve a LEED Silver rating from the USGBC. Uh, we will maximize energy efficiency within the building with an increased envelope thermal resistance. Uh, the building is also um, solar ready, meaning that the structure is set up to accept solar uh, panels on the, on the roof if you choose to do so in the future. Uh, we have an enhanced uh, student environment. We want to maximize the daylight and views for all of the students. 
And obviously in a post COVID world, we want to make sure that we enhance the indoor air quality for all of our students. To promote safety and security, all of our projects are include a card reader and security camera system. We have a locked entrance vestibule at the very uh, front door of the school to provide safety and security and knowledge of everyone entering the building. Uh, the landscaping is uh, maximized for, for good separation and visual control. And we make sure that we separate the bus traffic from other vehicular traffic on the site. Uh, some of our unique design features, uh, we've tried to keep the school with a very compact footprint uh, while also allowing maximum views out for the students. Uh, and provide a very efficient building circulation. Uh, we have a building that provides ultimate flexibility. We have a standardized classroom throughout the project so that any student, any, any teacher, any um, subject can move throughout the building providing uh, flexibility for the administration. Uh, we provide multiple collaborative learning spaces throughout. Uh, always uh, keeping cost in mind uh, of our projects. Uh, we conduct a very extensive geotechnical investigation throughout the site so we can classify all of our soils so that we know what's under the building when we begin construction so we minimize any surprises during that that may add added cost or delay the construction process. Also, uh, we provide a structural steel frame, which is a, a faster way of building uh, to help uh, reduce the construction duration. Architecturally, we want to simplify that footprint. We limit the use of concrete masing on the interior partitions as well as the exterior uh, to make sure that uh, we have a, a cheaper construction, which is also durable and stands up to the test of time. As we zoom into our vicinity map where Lansdowne High School currently located, uh, within a two mile radius of the school, there are two elementary schools, Lansdowne Elementary and Riverview Elementary School and Lansdowne Middle School is directly across the street from the site. As we zoom in closer to the actual site, I will note on the here for the site to fit better on the page, north is to your right. Uh, the existing school uh, sits on the south end of the site, uh, the existing uh, main entrance uh, right here, and the uh, existing stadium is to the north end of the site. Directly to the east is Lansdowne Road, directly to the south is Hollands Ferry Road, which is a more heavily trafficked road. And then directly to the west is Third Avenue. Right now, the bus loop goes right by the front door uh, and there is an existing parking lot. All, both the uh, existing parking and bus share the same entry. Uniquely about this site, the actual is, is the topography. Uh, the, the site actually slopes down to the uh, sort of left-hand side of the page from the uh, northwest to the southeast. Uh, and currently the fields are on sort of two plateaus with a ridge which uh, goes, uh, divides the two flat areas. Our, our plan is to uh, provide the sort of the phase one, this is the buildable area for the new site, uh, allowing the existing school to remain operational during construction. We know from historic documents that Hillcrest Pond Park used to be a quarry and a lot of the spoils from that quarry went out onto the site in the area where we have shown right there as disturbed soils. So we avoided that location for construction and placed the new Lansdowne High School over in the area where it currently occupied uh, the uh, stadium. The main entrance to the school will be located in the dot that you see right here. The new stadium will then, uh, after the new school is constructed, uh, then the students will move into the new building. The existing building will be re uh, removed and the new stadium will be placed on the south end of the site. The new baseball field, which doesn't quite fit on the site, will be placed over on the middle school site. The athletic entrance will be up the hill uh, on the main level of the building, on the south end of the building, and the auditorium entrance will be on the north end. The bus loop will come right off of Lansdowne Road and exit without uh, crossing over any uh, vehicular traffic. The parent drop off loop will come uh, off of the existing curb cut and both the bus loop and the parent drop off will both lead to, lead to the main entrance. Student parking will be uh, on the upper parking lot, also having access to that main front door. 
Teacher parking will be located in the north end. An auditorium for uh, entrance for after hours uh, plays and, and events will be located in the north end as well. Back of the building, we have the service drive. Uh, walking path uh, travel, we will provide a new walking path uh, from the south end of the site to the front door. Uh, the existing uh, path from the upper neighborhood will come down be improved to the front door, also providing entrance to the front door. Uh, and the uh, additional walking path from the southeast will be provided up to the front door. All of these walking paths will get to that front main entrance without crossing the bus path or the parent drop off loop. We had mentioned earlier the plateau on the site and how there was a ridge right through the middle of it. We've utilized that to help uh, with the construction of the new building and the layout. When you look at a cross section of the site uh, through there, there's a ridge right in that point, and that ridge is about the difference between one story and the school, about 16 feet, which allows us to put the building on that site and, and reduce the amount of dirt that we have to move to build the building, thus reducing the cost. As we look into our, our first floor plan, uh, this is showing how that first floor plan, you see the, the uh, classrooms down here uh, have natural daylight. Uh, and then as we move up the hill, there's an unexcavated area that's under underneath soil. And that's sort of our, our outline of the building above. The building is organized with a, a secure front entrance uh, vestibule and lobby with the administration suite directly uh, there by the security vestibule. They can see everyone who's coming and going for security purposes. And the health suite is located right next to the admin. The community schools initiative space is also located by the front of the building, which provides a uh, visual control from the administration as well. Along the path of that first floor, we have art rooms and the science classrooms are in the center classroom wing. Uh, we have some special education uh, classrooms uh, spread throughout the building. Our standard classrooms are in the wings and every classroom has collaborative learning spaces. On the main level of the building is organized around three main spaces, the main gym, the multi-purpose dining commons, and the auditorium. The Baltimore County Rec and Parks area is located over by the gym in between the fields and the gym for convenience. And the performing arts classrooms are located by the auditorium for performances. CTE classrooms, as we've mentioned, are spread throughout the building. Uh, we have some of the larger base spaces, uh, such as the um, carpentry and electrical spaces back by the stage so that they can uh, work with the performing arts and provide um, some, some backup to uh, stage performances. Standard classroom wings, uh, standard classes throughout the space, special education uh, classrooms are located uh, in the wings as well. The science wings in the center. And again, collaborative learning spaces in every classroom so that all students have access. Our guidance is centrally located. We've organized the, the building um, around a way to sort of separate the, the public space from the academic space. And this allows us to do things in after hours when we open up the building to uh, sort of separate out those uh, those academic areas. So the one way we can use this space in the evening is to open up the gym for uh, basketball and, and sports events through the main gym entrance, allowing the rest of the building to be locked off and closed off for security. We can also use for the auditorium the auditorium entrance to the right hand side of the page. As you come down the hall, we can use the multi purpose dining commons as a queuing uh, space uh, for and waiting lobby for the auditorium performances. The space can also be set up with both a gym event as well as an auditorium event while still using uh, having security and locking off those academic spaces secured after hours. On the uh, upper floor, we have some additional CTE classrooms. Uh, the ROTC program is also located on the upper floor. Ice classrooms continue in the center with standard classrooms throughout and some special education rooms. Mentioned before, collaborative learning spaces uh, throughout the space. Our learning commons centrally located overlooking the multi purpose uh, commons in the middle. 
and then uh, we'll get into some of the renderings to look at sort of this is our front view. Uh, this is sort of standing in the bus loop, uh, looking at the parent drop off to your right, both approaching the front entrance of that of the new Lansdowne High School. Sort of fly in and see the site. Uh, the vehicular traffic works. Everyone has access to the front door. Views from the admin area for everyone approaching and entering the building for visual control. Students can enter in the lobby. Access to the health suite. As we look into the main core of the space, there's a connection into the multi-purpose uh, multi commons. A centralized stair organizes the space and allows circulation throughout. If used to uh, collaborative spaces directly across the hall. As we down, go down the hallways, we have opportunities for um, visual control of classrooms as you walk down the hall for security purposes. And the collaborative space is open and available to all students. Coming in from the uh, performance wing, we see a dance studio right in the outside provided with natural daylight. Back by the auditorium or back yet yeah, for the uh, performances. And then our CTE classrooms, high bay areas. Separate area for classrooms and for uh, vocational space. Coming into the multi uh, purpose commons, centrally located, provided with plenty of natural light through roof windows. And the media center overlooking that and a nice daylight filled uh, media center for the students. In fact, a view to the front. I'll go through a few of those um, uh, renderings. The front lobby we shown, the central corridor, that circulation space, the breakout collaborative wings spaces, additional collaborative spaces, a view of the auditorium. Gymnasium. The multi purpose commons can be set up for lunch. It can be set up for science fairs, uh, as well as a um, gathering space uh, outside for evening performances. And that daylight uh, space for the media center for the uh, learning commons. With that, we'd like to open it up to any questions that you might have. Thank you. Um, board members, do you have any questions? Mr. McMillian, please go ahead. Good evening or good afternoon. I was really impressed with this. I'm not an architect or a designer, but I was really impressed with the, the presentation. Uh, I'm curious, did the Lansdowne faculty have input before the design? So let me try to answer that question. Uh, all of our designs are done with the collaboration of uh, what we call uh, a group of people uh, consisting of community members, staff, and principal. So they all had a chance to be part of the team. Okay. Uh, uh, has the Lansdowne faculty seen this presentation? Um, they have seen bits and pieces of that. We would like, we like to share it with the board before we really make it full public. So you are seeing the full presentation and they will very soon be seeing this also. OK, and what's the seating capacity of the uh, of the auditorium? The, the auditorium can seat 50 percent of the population of the school, so about 900 to 950 people. OK, and how about the gymnasium? Uh, the same. Huh. Um. And the cost of, of replacing the, the turf field and the stadium complex and all that's incorporated in the overall cost of the project? We do have all those items included in the cost estimate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Offerman? Yeah, I just want to comment that uh, I love all the, uh, all the opportunities for, uh, for natural light. 
I think the buildings built sometime in the past didn't didn't have that, and I think that's a really a really good feature to have, and I, I think it really improves the 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 overall school environment environment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alperman, and thank you for this presentation. Uh, like Mr. Alperman said, I love the use of natural daylight and uh, we wish this could have been a net zero design. But will this design, uh, will we apply to be LEED certified for this design? And my second question is, since the site seems to be sloping towards the southwest, is this where your stormwater management facilities will be? And um, Hillcrest Pond is an old mining site where the soil is tested for contamination. Yes, uh, first, first question was, um, What's your first question? The question was, uh, yes, lead certified. This will be lead certified. Be lead certified at a silver level. Um, yes, we did do a phase one environmental uh, impact study on the site. Uh, the soils were tested. Uh, the, everything is good and clear. Um, and our geo, our, our uh, stormwater management is worked out throughout the site. There are smaller pace, uh, facilities uh, around the site to take care of stormwater management. OK, thank you. Ms. Causey. Good afternoon and thank you for that presentation. Turn your device sound off and your team's mute. And then turn your microphone. Good afternoon and thank you for that presentation. Um, I Personally, I uh, am so grateful to see this design. It has been uh, many years in the works, um, and I appreciate uh, um, all of the community members and uh, school system staff members, and um, also all of the elected officials that contributed to uh, making sure that funding was available. Um, I had a question related to the feasibility study, and I wanted to understand how closely aligned to the feasibility study is the location of the replacement school, the ultimate square footage, and the estimate cost to construction? They are they are pretty much in line. The uh, there have been some cost um, changes in in the um, building industry lately, as you know, because uh, the uh, feasibility study was done pre-COVID, so we're now dealing with post-COVID construction numbers. However, we are in line with the construction budget. OK, thank you. And as for the square footage, how close did that come to the? We are within a few percentages of the square footages. OK, in the increased square footage or lower? Uh, I believe uh, I believe the feasibility study was around 306. I believe we're at 312. OK, thank you. Um, and then in line with um, previous board members' questions, uh, when you talked about the input from the school community, um, we know that the principals are typically involved, but we're also the department chairs, the athletic directors, and did they get to see um, drafts of that before the presentation to the board today? So, Mike, uh, would you like to take that question? <clears throat> sure. Uh, we had... Um, meetings and, and invites at different stages and levels that um, different parts of the staff were uh, able to come and listen and participate and give us critiques. We also had um, representatives from the staff and the, including the principal and the athletic director that came to periodic different meetings that we gave and they received updates. They haven't seen this full presentation. We typically take this full presentation to them after the board seen it and then we we share the full presentation with them and then we typically have a, a public meeting with the community after that as well okay thank you very much i really appreciate it thank you gentlemen for the sorry thank you gentlemen for the presentation um hearing no questions we're going to move forward so thank you very much Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Building and Contracts Committee for Tuesday, April 5th, 2022. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee 
at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board committee members will say their names before making and seconding a motion, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Deckwood, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Joes? Present. Mr. McMillian? Present. Ms. Hen? Mr. Kuhn? Mr. Offerman? Present. Three of the five committee members are here. Thank you, Ms. Duckwood. Since there's a quorum, we will proceed. Ms. Duckwood, please take a roll call of the staff present. Yes, ma'am. Mary Boswell McComas? Present. Mr. Chris Hartlove? Here. Jim Corns. Present. Mr. Pete Dixit. Present. Ms. Heather Lagerman. Mr. Sam Mustafer. Present. Dr. Catherine Pierdozzi. Present. Jennifer Kraft. Present. Jennifer Hernandez. Present. Amy Hetzler. Present. Mr. Merle Plate. Present. Mr. David Salvinar. Present. Debbie Piper. Present. Melanie Webster. Present. Ms. Joanne English Calvert. Present. Arla Simmons. Thank you. Are there any other BCPS staff members present that I did not call? Jennifer, this is Pedro Augusto. Pedro, thank you. Good afternoon, this is Megan Shea. Thank you, Megan. Sure. Jess Grimm from Transportation. Thank you, Jess. Anna Rung for Sangaroon, Office of Law. Thank you, Anna. I believe that's everyone, Ms. Jones. Thank you, Ms. Duckworth. This is Board Member Hen. I'm also here. I was going to call. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Please note for the record, Ms. Hen is present. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Hartlow, please state your name for the record and proceed with presenting the first contract. I'm sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Ms. Jose, board members. Um, my name is Chris Hartlove. I'm Chief Financial Officer, and I'm going to run through uh, the first group of, of contracts, and then Mr. Dixit will pick up um, on this second part, the, uh, the buildings uh, um, items. First item we have is uh, JB0710-21, Temporary Adult Assistance and Therapeutic Behav Behavioral Aids. Uh, this is a consent to us to the assignment of this contract from us medical staffing inc to us medical staffing llc are there any questions committee members please state your name and question hearing none we will proceed to the next contract mr hartlow please proceed with presenting the second contract okay um, next item is uh, contract LLY-425-22, non-public special education facilities. This is a new cooperative administration of programs contract to provide a comprehensive list of non-public schools available for the placement of students with disabilities for the Office of Special Education. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with 53 schools and contract spending authority of $276,145,000. Is 
Thank you, committee members. Any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Hartlow, please pr proceed with the next contract. LKO-416-19, Music Instruments, Supplies and Materials. This contract modification will provide for the continued purchase of music instruments, supplies and materials for the Office of Music Education and the Office of Dance Education. Approval is requested to increase contract spending authority to 2,900,000 with seven awarded contractors approved by the board on Tuesday, May 7th, 2019. The contract authority was 1.5 million and this, this action would uh, increase it to 2.9 million. Thank you. Committee members, any questions? Uh, hearing none, actually I do have one question and this might be to Ms. Shea. Um, this contract, as you, um, sorry, Will this make device, uh, musical instruments available to our children that cannot afford renting musical instruments? Because typically, as parents, we rent out musical instruments. Yeah, so um, thank you for the question, Ms. Joyce. Good afternoon. Um, yes, yeah, so this is the contract that we use to purchase any instruments. So as you know, some of our schools have an inventory that they will use as loaners for students that are not able to um, rent or purchase instruments. Um, the main purchase or rationale for the increase right now is also to help support Rossville Elementary. Um, and then also to be used for um, personal protective equipment for music programs. So any instruments that we have as part of the inventory in a school that are used to support students in the way you described would fall under this same contract. So will the kids be able to take the instruments home like they do with the rented musical instrument? Yes, yeah, so it's um, it's a great question. It's it's obviously dependent on um, the actual inventory available in the school. So and I'll just use an example. A school might have two trumpets and four students interested in playing the trumpet, um, in which case they use different mouthpieces and they negotiate that. So I can't say that it's always a one for one um, because it would depend on the interest of the students and the inventory that we have on hand. Uh, some of our music teachers encourage them to expand to other instruments that are similar to try to allow that so that they have the opportunity for practice. Um, if that's not available, then the teachers typically work with students to help them have time uh, to practice in the building. So sometimes they go home as part of um, that practice and sometimes they're used within the school. Ms. Hanson. Thank you, Ms. Doze. Um, will this contract be used to replace any instruments that are in disrepair? I remember asking about this the last time a contract yeah, came so, up to um, us. Thank you, Ms. Hen. We do have um, a different contract that talks about repairs. And so it really comes down to whether it's a brand new purchase and then it would be applicable under the terms of this contract, or we have another contract that does servicing and repairs. And so there's usually a tipping point um, if something is beyond repair and then we were purchasing something new, then it would fall under this contract. So I, I am asking about replacement because these are instruments that are beyond repair, that are well yes. beyond their life expectancy, that yes. have not been replaced. I'm going to date myself, but that were in place when I was in the school <laughs> that my kids have now been, they've seen much better days. Yes. Are we replacing so, um, those? Yeah, so if a school was, um, so the music office works closely with every school's team to do inventory and kind of take stock. As you may recall, we took a little hit with the instruments that spent way too much time at home without having that love and care of being back in the building and having teachers tweak them. And then there are some that are just beyond repair. So while we do not have unlimited funds, this is the um, contract that we would use for those purchases. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Sure. Mr. Hartlow, please proceed with the next contract. Okay. MWE-802-19, Modification English Learner Database. This is a consent to assignment of this contract from Elevation Inc. to Curriculum Associates, LLC. Thank you. Committee members, any questions? Hearing none. Please proceed with the next contract, Mr. Hartlow. Okay, uh, contracts five through 26 are all cohorts. I'll go through them quickly. Certainly we can stop on any particular ones uh, that you would like. Um, the uh, They all begin with COH, so I, I won't read that every time. Um, so first one is 900-22, Conditional Teaching Math Accelerated Certification for Teaching Program. 
then we have 901-22 uh, conditional teaching English accelerated certification for teaching program. 902-22 um, ACT certification area secondary special education six adult. 903-22 masters of art arts in teaching math and science. 904-22 master of science in instructional technology school library 905-22 master of education in reading reading specialist and esol certification 906.906-22 master of science transformational educational leadership 907-22 secondary mathematics masters of arts in education 908-22 post baccalaureate certificate in TESOL with a second language literacy focus. 909-22 Urban Educational Leadership Post Master's Certificate Program. 910-22 CCBC Secondary Special Education Cohort 2022. 911-22 ACCT Certification Area Elementary Special Education 1-8, 1-8. Uh, 912-22 CCBC Secondary English Cohort 2022, 913-22 Educational Technology Master's Degree with Embedded Online Learning and uh, Teaching Certificate, 914-22 Administration 1 Certification Program, 915-22 cultural, Culturally Responsive Graduate Special Educators, 916-22 Master of Science in Elementary Education with a focus on equitable approaches to mathematics and science, technology, engineering, and math STEM instruction. 917-22 Master of Science Reading Specialist liter Literacy Leadership with focus in teaching English to speakers of other languages, TESOL. 918-22 Pathway Preparation to Special Education Certification. 919-22 Master of Arts in Leadership in Teaching ESOL. Master of Arts in, I'm sorry, 920-22 Masters of Art, Arts in Teaching English Education. And finally, 921-22 Master of Arts in Teaching Mathematics Education. Thank you, Mr. Horn. Sorry. Um, any questions, committee members? Ms. Hen, please proceed. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Um, a couple of these recommended contract awards lead to a degree with a focus on reading or reading specialists. And I'm curious as to what review has been made of the curriculum and whether or not that has evolved to include the science of reading. We've heard from teachers um, expressing a desire for that specific instruction. Um, has that review taken place and do these programs include that specific instruction? That's a good question. I don't know if we have someone on. Yes, who... I'm, sure. I'm here. This is Jennifer Kraft. Um, I can respond to that. Um, so we are considering two programs. Thank you, first of all, for that question. Such a good question and so important. Um, so the two that we ended up recommending forward um, were from Towson University and from McDaniel. And Towson specifically does uh, call out the science of reading um, in uh, what they have put forward. Um, additionally, they have an emphasis on English language learners, which supports our compass. Um, the one from McDaniel is also very interesting because they also um, do the science of reading and their focus really is um, the reading specialist as a literacy leader. And they really have evolved into moving the reading specialist just out of an interventionist to actually being a leader for literacy in their school. And their course uh, syllabi that um, I reviewed um, really show the elevation of that um, leadership. And thank you for that um, response. And in reviewing that syllabi, can you speak to specifically the science of reading? Or is your response yeah, that me, yes, that me, does include specific um, coursework in that? 
So reading specialists will implement. So like, for example, they actually have a course that says early literacy foundations, which I have to tell you after reviewing lots of programs, they didn't all have a course like this. Um, I'm sorry, and this one is from McDaniel specifically. So um, it says this course examines the foundations of early literacy from an interactive perspective. The course content addresses assessment measures, data analysis, instructional methodologies, and materials for emergent and early readers. Candidates assume the role of the contemporary reading specialist to implement demonstration lessons in phonological awareness, phonics development, print concepts, and strategic literacy, including reading behaviors. But not the neuroscience or the science behind how children learn to read. These are um, overviews. I would have to, I'm, I'm looking really quickly. Um, I would have to get a more comprehensive syllabi to answer that because these are the, the really, you know, concrete, the, I'm sorry, the really um, shortened ones where they just give the course description. I would actually have to look at their um, full trajectory to be able to answer that question because I don't want to assume anything. OK, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Any more questions, committee members? Ms. Rowe, are you still in the meeting? OK, it looks like she's. Yes, I'm in the meeting. Uh, you'll have to drop off. You're making a quorum sure. of the committee. OK, thank you. I'm, I'm the board, sorry. Thank you. Um, hearing none, Mr. Hartlow, please proceed with the next contract. OK, I believe we're on 27, which is uh, GDA-323-22 Information Technology Device and Hardware Financing. This is a new cooperative contract for financing and leasing of technology equipment for the Division of Information Technology. Approval is requested for a, a for one nine month contract with three recommended bidder and contract spending authority of one million five hundred thousand. Committee members, any questions? Ms. Hen, please proceed. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Um, what specific equipment will be purchased under this contract? Hi, this is Pedro. Hi. It's it's the IT equipment. So this is for um, any uh, desktop computing equipment, any um, any uh, server network equipment. What we're really what this is doing is it, it doesn't change how we're buying. What it's doing it's splitting the financing portion of it with the actual delivery of services, or in this case, uh, hardware. Uh, by splitting out the two portions, we're actually uh, able to better negotiate financing rates and not be dictated either by the um, the the uh, contract mechanism, a contract tool that this that the purchase of the equipment's being done. So it's to answer your first question, it's really any of our um, IT equipment that we're going to go in bulk with. OK, so this is really just for the financing then. It is. It's it's purely for financing. It. OK, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, since we have a lot of contracts, we're going to move forward with only committee members questions at this time. Board members can ask their questions via email or the full board meeting. Mr. Hartlow, please proceed with the next contract. OK. LLY-418-22 Telecommunications Master Service Agreement. This is a new cooperative contract for voice over internet protocol the uh, voice over IP service for the Department of Information Technology. Approval is requested for a one year, 10 month contract with one recommended bidder and a contract spending authority of $1 million. Thank you. Committee members, any questions? Thank you. Uh, hearing none, Mr. Hartlow, please proceed with the next contract. 
OK, LLY-415-22, purchase of various motor vehicles. This is a new competitively bid contract for various motor vehicles for the Office of Transportation. Approval is requested for a one year term with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $2,837,644. Okay. Thank you, and committee member. I think committee members, any questions? Uh, hearing none, Mr. Hartlow, please proceed with the next contract. Okay. LLY-417-22 USDA Processed Commodities. This is a new competitively bid contract for USDA Processed Commodities for the Office of Food and Nutrition Services. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with 24 recommended bidders and contract spending authority of $32,500,000. Committee members, any questions? Ms. Hen, please proceed. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Um, could you explain for the board, please, uh, what is included in a USDA processed commodity since this is a new contract award? Are these USDA approved um, food items? Yes, and I, I'm not sure if we have someone from food service. I know um, uh, Ms. Webster is here. Uh, I don't know if she can address that. This is Jamie Hetzler from Food and Nutrition. We have oh. uh, Joanne on the line. She should be able to explain it um, for us. Um, yes, yeah, so USDA commodities are not new to Baltimore County Public Schools. We, in the past, they have been tied in with our regular food bid. But basically what this is, is um, products that have, or excuse me, vendors that have been approved by the USDA and have um, a contract with the state of Maryland to process um, USDA commodities into usable forms. So such companies as Tyson and uh, Genio Turkey um, take uh, com USDA commodities and process, process them into products that um, we use on the lunch and breakfast menu. So in essence, the commodity portion of it is uh, at no cost to us, the processing portion of it um, is what is the cost. OK, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hartlow, please proceed with the next contract. Um, and actually, I believe if Mr. Dix is still on the line, I believe this one is, is uh, yours. That's true. Thank you, mm -hmm. Mr. Hartlow. Um, the next contract, ASI 818-22, is for uh, maintenance and preventing maintenance on stormwater management services. Uh, the contract is for five years and total amount is one million fifty thousand dollars. Thank you. Committee members, any questions? I do have one question, Mr. Dixit. Is this for existing facilities that are not um, compliant with MD stormwater management rule or is this improvements? So this is primarily for checking to make sure that they are functional as they should be. And if there's any obvious uh, items, for example, vegetation or dead vegetation or damaged fence, we take care of that. If there are any repairs needed that are included in this contract, this is not for creating new stormwater management problems. Thank you. Ms. Kazi, do you have a question on this contract, stormwater management? No, I do not. I have a question on prior contracts. Thank you. Mr. Dixit, please proceed with the next contract. The next contract is CWA 114 22. This is for uh, track surface replacement at Pikesville High School. Um, the the contract is in the amount of 623,819 plus contingency totaling $686,201. Uh, it is primarily funded by a grant uh, with some funding uh, from the capital program. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Uh, is this the contract that was pulled at the previous board meeting? That's correct. The bidder 
I believe last time was not responsive bidder, did not submit all the papers. So now this is the responsive bidder. OK, thank you. Committee members, any questions? Mr. McMillian, please proceed. Mr. Mr. Dixon, I'm, I'm curious, how many years do you try to get out of a track before you replace it? So there is no fixed life of a track that I know of. Um, if there are any repairs needed or if there are any safety concerns, we take care of it uh, within the operating budget maintenance funding. Uh, but as you know, a uh, lot of uh, site work uh, has not been ta taken care of because of competing priorities. Uh, recently, county has allocated additional funds, so we perhaps will be doing a lot of additional uh, tracks and other site projects. OK, I'm curious, Mr. Dixon, can you tell me when the last time Pikesville had their track replaced? So. Uh, let me see if I have that. Uh, I can take a guess. Most of these are pretty old and we have been maintaining them. Uh, 2005 is, I believe, from my record, running track replacement. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Ms. Hen, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Mr. Dixit, um, can you tell us what the approximate range for of the cost for a track replacement would be based on those we've re replaced? So the one that the latest one that you're looking at is 686,000 and construction costs are rapidly increasing. So uh, any crystal ball perhaps will be wrong, but you can add 10 percent in any any uh, construction cost estimate because of the increasing cost. So what would what would drive that that increase something that would drive that increase? So or drive the contingency rather. So contingency and increase these are two different things. Uh, contingencies are for any unanticipated items that are found during the construction process and Costs are what the market will bear. So we put specs out on the market, depending on the market conditions, uh, depending on the amount of work that is out there and the contractors available, uh, cost fluctuates significantly. Uh, it could vary anywhere from 10 to 40 percent for the same amount of work. So it's difficult to predict these days because of COVID-19, uh, backup of supplies, uh, all of the things that you have been hearing in media, uh, construction costs have become totally unpredictable. OK, so Thank this you. number of 686 seemed low when I reviewed this based on the fact that another high school in Baltimore County recently received a quote for 800,000. So I'm curious as to what may have driven that variance, not that it applies to this contract, but the fact that our if the contingency or what our, our actual costs could be much higher. Um, do Did we require the, um, I guess it would be the state in this case, to sign a guarantee for the difference in funding should the actual costs come in much higher so, than 686? So this is the lowest bid that we have received from a responsive bidder. There is no guarantee that state requires. So in my mind, Regardless of the source of funding, uh, we still follow the same procurement process. Um, in some federal uh, funded projects, uh, there are clause of prevailing wages that increases the cost of construction. But for state grants, for county, it is the same process. And like I said, it's the market conditions that dictate the price. And also, what is included in the scope of work, each track, may have slight different scope of work. Sure, so my, my final follow up question to that then is if it were a private don't for private donors. Yes, uh, my Miss Hen, is this relevant to this contract? It because is. You seem to be going into a no. 101 for it building is, in Mr. Time. I'd like to finish my question. It's relevant to this contract. Okay, okay. So Mr. Dixit, for 
privately funded projects, we require the donor to sign off on any difference. Um, should the project exceed the um, donation, we require the donor to guarantee that. For a state funded project, there is no guarantee. Is that correct? Can you speak to that? Well, I'm, I'm just, not, I want to ask who would guarantee that so that we don't end up with a track that, that doesn't get completed. Do we incur that cost out of our operating budget or does the state step forward? So for private donors, uh, uh, they have to pay for any additional cost. Um, but for all of the state funded or local funded, if the bids are higher, we go back to our funding partner, which is county in this case, and if they approve additional funds, then we award it. If they do not, we do not award it. OK, but the, I'm not asking about the bids. I'm asking about the final cost. So should the project costs exceed the bids, who is responsible for that in this case? So in this case, uh, board is only approving this amount. If the amount is going to be higher than this, then we have to find a funding source and we have to come back to you for approval. You have to ex we have to explain to you why the cost is higher and why we are asking for approval. And we need to find the funding source. That answers my question. Thank you. OK, go ahead, Mr. McMillian. Mr. Dixon, I, I want to question you on the scope of work with a track. Because it seems to me that you're replacing the track, you're replacing the pits, the runways, the um, high jump pit, the pole ball pit. It, it seems like the scope would be very, very similar across the board at all these high schools. Can, can you explain that to me just briefly? Sure, absolutely. So let me let me tell you what the scope of work for this project is, and that'll give you an idea about what the scope, why, why it could vary. So in this case, removal of existing rubber surface from running track, long jump and triple jump runways, demolition of pole vault runway, construction of new pole vault runway, installation of new rubber surface, painting marking on running track, long jump and triple jump runways. Now this may not be exactly the same for some other project that we might do. We have also included um, rubber surface, at the high jump area, that's going to be replaced. We have also included new sand at the long jump and triple jump runway. Now, all of the other tracks we do, they may have other needs and may not have these needs. And it may sound like small to you, but just for those two add alternates, it adds up to about seventy thousand dollars. So each contract, each project has its own scope of work and is going through different market condition at any given time. I hope thank I you very much. Question. Thank you. And um, I remind committee members that the scope of the work is contained in the bid. Um, Mr. Dixit, please proceed with the next contract. So the next series of contract, I will try to condense Excuse it. Excuse me, Ms. With Joes, you. I had already put in the chat that I had questions. Is this relevant to this contract? Because I want to make sure we are short on time and uh, committee members don't go off on a tangent talking about other schools and what happened in their district. So if it's relevant to this contract, I'll allow it. So Thank you. So um, Mr. Dixit, um, what grants uh, are related to this that are identified as the funding source? So this, this grant is a special capital grant that is initiated by a uh, local elected official. Uh, it's called a state capital grant. Thank you. And then um, at a previous meeting, there was a contract for Pikesville High School that at the request of staff was withdrawn during a meeting that had uh, four vendors that were outlined with their costs, including the alternates. Um, and on this contract, there's only one. So could you speak to the differences of the prior contract um, and this contract? So that's a procurement question. Um, if Ms. Webster is here, she can help you 
but my understanding it that this is the only responsive bidder we had and the other was others were not but i'll let miss webster answer that question Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, originally, when we opened the solicitations, we did have four proposals to review, and as we reviewed them, three of those bidders did not meet all of the requirements that they needed to meet in order to be able to be considered responsive or responsible, which left us with the one bidder which you see tonight. So the document that was presented to the board um, was was not fully vetted prior to the meeting. Is that the situation? That we were still reviewing the, the, the proposals that we received, yes. Okay, thank you. And then Mr. Dixit referred to um, additional funding to be available um, to do other tracks uh, because we know that there's other tracks, including Hereford High School in my district. Ms. Kazi, that's not relevant to not this contract. We're not talking about Hereford. Uh, Mr. Excuse Dixit, me, please Ms. proceed Jones, with the next contract. Moment, I can tell you please why it's the relevant next because the board is supposed to be uh, making sure that we provide equitable facilities. Yes, and this is not students. relevant to this contract. You keep it you did the same thing at the last contract meeting. According to policy Point 7330, of order. it is up to the board to make sure that funding is equitably applied. Uh, please me. proceed I with the next contract, Mr. Dixit, as, as the committee chair, I'm going to make the decision. Contrary to our civility con uh, code. May I be allowed to continue? No, we are proceeding with the next contract. We are out um, of I time. would just like to uh, state clearly that this is an arbitrary decision uh, by the chair of this committee to prevent me thank from you. asking can, questions can that are relevant. And so I will be asking them in the open board yeah, meeting. Thank you very much. Please ask that in the open. And I have reminded board and committee members time and again to bring questions via email, especially long rambling questions that are not relevant or you're trying to understand how procurement works. You don't know how. Point of um, order. So you know, ask them in an email. That is in contradiction to our civility code. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Please proceed with the next contract. So the next contract is uh, this is a uh, series of contracts CWA 105-22. This is item 33 through item 45. This is for the renovation and addition of Pine Grove Middle School. As board members will remember, this project is part of the capital improvement program approved by the board and uh, this will go a long way towards addressing overcrowding issues in the eastern part of the county, northeastern part of the county. Uh, I'm going to condense all of these contracts. There are 13 packages. I will share with you the trade of each package, number of bidders, name of the lowest bidder, and amount including contingency, and then at the end, I'll request your approval. So, with 13 packages, they include um, package 1A is for testing. There were four bidders. The successful bidder is SC Stevenson Consulting in the amount of 85,635, and all of these amounts include contingency, site work, three bidders. Lowest bidder is Urban and Zinc. 4,516,710. 3A concrete, three bidders. Lowest bidder is GLB construction in the amount of 364,161. 4A package is masonry. Ken Ron masonry, two bidders, $421,300. Package 5A is steel. There's only one bidder. S.A. Holak Ironworks in the amount of $2,314,840. Package 6A is general construction. Three bidders. Bronner Builders is the lowest bidder. $6,944,388. 7A package is roofing. Three bidders. Lowest bidder is interstate construction. Uh, amount is 1,078,000. Uh, 
Uh, package 8A is for window and storefronts, two bidders. Uh, Zephyr Aluminum, $658,900. Package 9A is drywall, drywall and ceilings, four bidders. Uh, can M Contractors, $3,232,314. 9D is flooring, one bidder and an R Enterprises, $2,077,240. 9E is painting, two bidders, NLP Enterprises, $537,735. 15A is mechanical, five bidders. GE Tignal is the lowest bidder, $8,526,100. 16A is electrical, two bidders. Bowmark is the lowest bidder, with $6,336,657. So all of these contracts um, with 13 packages, we request your approval. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. I believe Ms. Dokun has a question. I do, thanks, Ms. Joseph. Um, Mr. Dixit, as you went through that list, and as I pointed out before, um, the the contract associated, I believe it's 5A with steel, there was only one bidder. And my concern is, and I don't know who actually, I don't know um, if we have procurement on and, and the people involved in managing the RFP and RF and, and the bids, but I find it troubling that we aren't, you know, when we only get one bid that we don't reach out directly to other companies that do this type of work because it seems, as if it's almost, you know, this is now at least twice that I've seen this, if not three times, that this is the only supplier who happens to be in Virginia, not even in Maryland, for steel for school projects. So I don't know, you know, what, if any comments you might have, but I, I am curious about this procurement in general since it's in essence single sourced. So I'll, I'll just share with you what I know and then I'll transfer it to Ms. Webster. Uh, if you note in the board exhibit, there were 188 vendors that it was issued to. Mr. And Dixit, eight, Mr. Dixit, I've yeah. seen this and I've asked the question. That means 188 people in total looked at it. Yes. Doesn't mean 188 steel companies looked at it. So I just want to clarify that for the record because well, I don't want anyone to, you know, if I'm if I'm a mason, I'm not going to bid on steel, right? So I just want to be clear. So I shared with you what I know, and the same process was used for this package than was used for any other package. So with that, Ms. Webster, if you have anything to add to. Sure, I can add to that. Um, we advertise all of our solicitations through eMaryland Marketplace, which is required legally. Uh, when we have a large school construction project like this, we also reach out to um, Blue Book, who is well known in the contracting industry, the com um, construction industry, and they will post it on their site for us um, as a project. And we also use the uh, construction management firm who will reach out to individual contractors or suppliers that they know um, in an attempt to gain more participation on these packages that can sometimes be a little bit more troubling. I think that one of the impacts that we had with this particular package, this steel package, is that when we're looking at the length of construction for a new uh, for a new middle school, um, the steel companies are concerned about committing to a fixed price, given that they may not be installing some of this for until a year has passed, and they're not sure what the industry is going to do in that ensuing time frame. Does that so, answer your question? Well, it, it answers a question. It doesn't actually get to the heart of the matter that we only have one bid. I guess one of my concerns, and perhaps we need to be a little more um, and, um, aggressive in reaching out to companies that provide steel, 
because uh, like I said, this is at least the second time I've seen only one bid and this company is the only bidder. So um, I'm not saying you're not doing everything you can. I'm saying maybe we need to take steps beyond the our normal process when we're seeing only one bid for you know over $2 million contract. So um, that's unfortunate. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Kuhn. Uh, committee members, any questions? McMillan, Ms. Hen, Mr. Offerman. All right. Um, I, I do want to clarify with um, for this bid as well, because if it was just one bid and they can provide the different services, they do team up because you have to follow procurement laws. It's an open market where you bid out and they all have to be pre-qualified vendors that come into the Maryland marketplace. So they take it's the free market forms its place so if they can do masonry they're going to team up with a company that does masonry if they won the bid um yes being that we're bidding this by individual trade packages this particular one if they were not a steel company they just simply wouldn't bid on the steel portion of this work got it thank you um committee members no more questions um, uh, hearing none, do you have any questions? I'm only taking committee members' questions. Um, I will now entertain a motion to recommend that items 1 through 45 be moved to the full board for approval. So the question moved, is on, Offerman. Thank you. The question is on the recommended approval of contracts 1 through 45 for board action. Is there a second? Second. I'll second it. Um, those in favor, please say yes. Those opposed, please say no. Ms. Deckwood, Ms. please Ms. call Jones, the roll. Ms. Jones, I had my hand up and I also had, uh, this is Ms. Causey, thank you. I had put in the chat that I had a question on this steel contract. And we're in the middle of a vote, Ms. Causey. Can um, you please actually, proceed? Ms. Um, excuse me, Ms. Uh, the chair, chair has Joe's, the parliamentary procedure is after there's a second to ask for discussion. Before the You're not vote. part of the committee, so I'm asking, are there any questions? I am not part of the committee, but I'm a board member who is quite well versed in parliamentary procedure. I'm looking for these meetings to be handled with parliamentary she's procedure. I have a question about steel that I think would be helpful. Ms. Joes, you're on mute. Yes, um, That's board please go ahead. She just called me a name and I'm recording that for future reference. Yes, go ahead. M Mr. Um, Dix, Mr. Corns, please mute. Ms. Deckbutt, please take a roll call vote. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Joes? Yes. That's four in favor, one against. Thank you. There being four in the affirmative, the motion passes. Contracts one through 45 will be moved forward to the board. Um, the last item on the agenda is announcements. The next building and contracts committee will be held on Monday, May 2nd, 2022 at 5 p.m. Is there any further business? Hearing none, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.